Uh, hi, this is Elected, the podcast, and it's a little bit, I'm going to say off the top, I'm a little bit nervous because this <laughs> is the first time I've ever recorded one with someone in real life before. They're sitting like right beside me. Um, so it's just a little bit different, a little bit fun. So um, welcome. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, it's important to me on my own personal journey to acknowledge and share that I am personally and professionally committed to learning the history of colonialism and the ongoing systemic violence against Indigenous peoples. This we are today on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, the Kani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda Nations, Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Uh, so uh, today's guest is Karina Gould, and I'm very excited. I'm like trying not to like I'm trying to contain myself. Um, before we get into it, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. And I'll also start by saying, um, if anyone is listening and you are interested in becoming a sponsor of this podcast, please reach out to me. It's something um, that I need in order to keep it growing and to be able to do uh, a better job of creating better quality content and having um, guests like Minister Gould on. So if you're interested in that, please reach out. So if you can start off by letting everyone who you know who you are and the amazing things that you do, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. I'm a huge fan um, and I uh, really love what, what you're doing. I think it's really important and I think it's a great space, not just physically, but also virtually to bring um, women and allies together that are interested in politics and interested in advancing uh, feminism. So thank yes. you for, for doing that. I think you've inspired a lot of Canadians. Um, and I know a lot of female politicians kind of feel seen. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Um, so as was mentioned, my name is Karina Gould. I'm the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development at the federal government. I'm also the Member of Parliament uh, for Burlington. And um, I'm the mom to Oliver. He just turned four. He was born on March 8th. I like to say he's a oh. feminist. He chose the date, not me. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I have a Benjamin whose birthday is March 6th. Oh, nice. So they're almost, and I did pick that day because yeah. otherwise he would still be in my body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say that I had to evict him. <laughs> we, were, we were getting close because okay. he, was, he was, I guess, uh, five days Mm. overdue and uh i was getting to the point where i was going to go for um for an inducement but yeah. uh nope he decided to come at mid it was like 12 32 a.m on march oh. 8th and he was like all right, all right i'm ready it. yeah so yeah. he's born at 9 32. it's so interesting because um my first william who's four um we, he he came like three weeks early. My husband and I had just sat down to watch like the Colbert show and my water broke like completely naturally. And so when I was pregnant the second time, I was thinking like, okay, if this happened once, like, yeah, it's going to happen right. again. Two vaginal sweeps and an induction later. Yeah. I, he, I think he would still be in my body. <laughs> I, oh, I'm, I'm like, I, I had to have my water broken and that's one of the worst memories that oh, I really? had. It was so painful. Yeah. Um, it was they awful. did it. They did that to me and I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know. Oh yeah. No, it was awful. Yeah. So I'm glad it wasn't your experience. Yeah. It's, I like actually to think that, um, I'm not sure maybe if Oliver's like this, but yeah. how we, how they arrive is kind of like kind of representative of their personalities. Totally. totally. Oh. Oliver is like, um, uh, super cuddly and mm. like very much attached to me and I feel like that was exactly the mm. way that he was um from you know from before he was born until after yeah. like he was kind of like no I'm good like I don't need That's like I'm comfortable been. and he's always like that yeah. yeah yeah William who came out like three weeks early is like just ready to go on a plane he just anyway yeah, anyways this is not <laughs> what the podcast is about our verse this is not a our story, story. <laughs> yeah we could, I guess, spend like an hour talking about that. But um, so uh, the child care deals that you have signed, yeah. every province and I believe now territory. every territory has yeah. signed on. So the last one being Ontario. Yeah. Um, so congratulations. I can't imagine what it was like to negotiate every single one of those deals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, every single negotiation was totally different. Um, I only negotiated the last five. Okay. So Minister Hussein, uh, who's my predecessor, mm. negotiated the first eight. Um, 
those ones happened very quickly. Um, so, you know, starting with British Columbia and I think maybe Saskatchewan or Manitoba was um, the last before the federal election. Mm -hmm. um, so in like a six week period, um, all of those negotiations were done. And then I negotiated um, the easier ones, I guess, you know, uh, New Brunswick, Al or first Alberta, New Brunswick, um, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and then finally uh, Ontario. Mm. I guess I shouldn't say easier. They were a bit more complicated, but yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was, um, it was great. Um, and it's uh, one of the things that I still kind of can't believe is that this is, this is the, it's historic that we have this, but this is the biggest social policy change in Canada since the, since the advent of Medicare, right? Like yeah. in, in 50, 40, 50 years, like this is the biggest social policy change um, that the that Canadians are going to experience. And that's pretty cool. Um, but it's also, you know, when Minister Freeland introduced the budget a year ago, right? $30 billion over the next five years, $9 billion ongoing thereafter. Um, we negotiated all 13 agreements in a year. I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Right? It took 10 years to get all the provinces and territories signed up for Medicare. Well, think about, I even think about it in the context of like a free trade agreement. Yeah. Right? Like dealing with all of those, like, it's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really exciting. And I mean, of course, here in Alberta, families are already um, you know, seeing, seeing mm -hmm. the difference. And um, I know you spoke with uh, Minister Schultz recently, but I had coffee with her in Edmonton before this. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on and it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, and, you know, each province and territory has milestones that they have to achieve over the next five years. Everyone has to reduce fees on average by 50% by the end of this year. They need to create more spaces because it's not just about affordability. It's also about making sure that those spaces are available because I know for parents across the country, wait lists for licensed care can go on for years, mm -hmm. right? And you and I were talking before, um, before we started recording, but you know, it's for, for some parents, particularly for women, particularly for mothers, um, they might be spending more mm -hmm. paying for childcare than what they're earning. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they're actually going into debt to pay for childcare so that they can stay in the workforce. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, so many people like to frame childcare as like, as kind of, a, you know, a, a luxury type item. Mm -hmm. And it's actually like fundamental to like families. It's not, this isn't like, it's not like a, you know, do we want to build a monorail? Like, that's not what it's like, yeah. like in terms of <laughs> something know, crazy. It's, it's like, yeah. it's really necessary. It's, it's fundamental, not just to families, but to society, yeah. to our economy, yeah. right? Like, you know, we don't, we don't give early childhood edu educators the value and the credit that they deserve, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they, in many places are, are underpaid, right? They're undervalued. Um, but if we think about it, like during the pandemic, they went to work mm -hmm. so we could go to work. Yeah. Right. Like if they when child, I don't know what it was like in Alberta, but in Ontario, child care centers were closed in the first wave of the pandemic from, um, you know, March 2020 to July or August 2020. I <laughs> worked as a cabinet minister, as a member of parliament from home with my two year olds. Right. Mm -hmm. That was not easy. Yeah. You know, I know what that's like. That yeah. was, and you know, and I just had one child and I had a husband who, you know, did the majority of the childcare because like, you know, I was working 12 to 16 hours a day. Right. Like it was, it was really, really hard. Um, and I can say that, you know, the relief and gratitude that I felt when childcare is reopened, mm -hmm. you know, and, and my family felt and like, it, like they went to work so that the rest of us could go to work. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think the child care agreements were able to happen when they did, right? Because for 50 years, women and their allies in this country have been fighting for affordable care, right? They've been fighting for that. Like the Royal Commission on the Status of Women came out in 1950, right? Asking for universal child care, right? Advocates have been fighting for decades for this. Actually, when I was in Edmonton, Donna from, um, I think it's the Alberta, uh, anyways, she, um, she showed me this newspaper article from 1986, mm -hmm. right? It was all about childcare. 
And the headline was childcare is not a luxury. It's mm. a necessity. Yeah. Right. Um, but like women have been fighting for this for so long and it took unfortunately a global pandemic for the rest of society to realize like, oh, actually this matters because mm. people won't go to work without it. Well, and also I think that being in a home where everyone was present because so often of the unpaid labor burden falls onto the shoulders of women yeah. still to this day um, and disproportionately so during the pandemic but all of a sudden people husbands fathers partners whoever had been able to you know um, leave the home um, suddenly was like wow this is is this what it's like? Like, yeah. is or is how hard it or is? Business off business yeah. business owners and bosses who were like, you know, listening to their employees with you know kids yeah. in the background and seeing how stressed their their employees were because not only do, were they trying to work, but they were also trying to care for their children. Well, it was no longer children. visible. No, exactly. It like brought. Um, it's funny, Minister Freeland, sometimes when she talks about me, will say, um, you know, when she had her kids, it was like, she was trying to pretend they didn't exist. Mm. Right. And then like, when I had Oliver, it was like, nope, guess what? I'm mom. He's coming everywhere with yeah. me. Right. And so it was like totally breaking down those barriers between like public and private life. Mm -hmm. And it was just it's like, yeah, guess what? This is the reality. Yeah. And like, we can't hide it because we're all here. Well, it, no, it went from being like the dad who did famously did that, um, that interview oh, in yeah. Korea yeah. and he had his, his child like run in yeah. and it was like a viral sensation yeah. and, you know, uh, uh, but that was like the daily reality for yeah. like everyone. Yeah. That wasn't a viral video. It was like our daily lives. Yeah. Um, and for me, my experience was from like, so March of 2020 until September, um, because I was the one who had the most job flexibility. Right. Um, I was, I was caregiver yeah. and we didn't have any childcare options. And, um, and, and then, so I would be with the boys all during the day and then I would do Madame Premier at night. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes when I talk about it, I actually get emotional. I'm not sure. right now, but yeah. um, sometimes when I think about it, because it, it was like, it was so hard. Totally. And I'm for you too. It must have been. Oh, the stress, like just the stress on, on your family was, yeah, it was so, yeah, so hard. And I have like, I have so many memories of, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, because for my son, like he's used to me not being home, right? Like I travel a lot in Ottawa, um, but when I'm home, I'm home and I'm present. Right. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was really hard that I, I was home, but I wasn't available. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I would like hide in the basement mm -hmm. uh, to take all of my calls and I would hear him calling for no. me and crying for me. And my poor husband was like trying to, you know, distract yeah. him. And then at one point, like he was crying so much. I just, I had to stop my meeting yeah. and I was like, I'm really sorry. Like, I just have to go get my son. And, and I brought him down and uh, this lovely person on the other side was like, <laughs> like it was a zoom meeting and he was like do you think Oliver would like a song oh and I was like I think so <laughs> <laughs> and he just like he pulled up a guitar really and he started singing like you are my sunshine oh my and and it was like that moment where I was like yeah we're all going through this oh, like wow. it was just like this moment of humanity where it was like okay I actually don't have to hide and pretend mm. that like that this is hard like it's yeah. ev I think everyone's just has a better understanding yeah. of it now I think that's a really that's so beautiful yeah. also, also that much, that person must be like a, a saint a saint and yeah. just like a really genuinely beautiful person yeah. um but i think that's also uh kind of a good segue into like how did you know like you as a mom but also as a person and like being now i think we're kind of we've reached hopefully a point where because we just like have exposed everyone that we've ever been on a zoom with to our families and yeah. like our daily realities um to like being women in politics and also and business and in whatever sphere you may be and just being like this is the way it is and like I'm not going to necessarily apologize for this anymore yeah. um so like how do you deal with that Oh, it's a good question because, um, so I was, uh, the first cabinet minister to have a baby while holding that office. Um, and so that, um, 
it was very funny because my husband and I, when I decided to run for politics, he was like, yeah, yeah, you go for it. I'll support you. But like, I want to have a family. Like that's important. And, and that was important to me too. Um, and so we had kind of decided we were going to start having a family. And then the prime minister appointed me to cabinet. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> it's all at once. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and uh, it's kind of funny because, you know, the second person I told I was pregnant was the prime minister. Really? Canada, right? yeah, okay, that's true. Because <laughs> uh, I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't want him to have to find out. Another what, way. And what I'm curious, like, what was his reaction? He the first. So I called him and uh, I said, you know, um, Prime Minister, I'm just wondering what the policy is for a cabinet minister who is going to go on maternity leave. Mm-hmm. And he just was like, Oh my gosh, Karina. Oh my gosh. He said, You know what? We're going to make this work. Hmm. Whatever it takes, we're going to make it work so that you can be successful in this. That's so great. And. Um, and he did, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really appreciative of that because I think it it could have gone really differently if I hadn't have had the support from him and his team because mm-hmm. the whole, like, machinery of government had to adapt to this, this situation that, like, has never happened before and mm-hmm. would not have been acceptable, yeah. right? But because he was there championing it and mm-hmm. saying, like, no, everyone is going to make this work, um, it did. It was still super hard. I'm <laughs> sure. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It was still super hard. Um, but he was incredibly, incredibly supportive and, um, and really, you know, made a point and an effort to say like, we are going to support this so that Karina's not, she's not just the first, but she's also not the mm-hmm. last. Right. Um, and so that, that was amazing. Um, but I have to tell you, like it, I was, it was, I was very self-conscious about being pregnant on the hill because there are not a lot of pregnant people walking around the hill. Um, and then I was really worried about the reaction of my community as well, right? In Burlington? In Burlington, which did not pan out. Like everyone was super supportive, super excited. Like I feel like Oliver has been um, adopted by the whole community and everyone, mm-hmm. like not, I guess not everyone, but like most people, you know, like love him and are excited about him. And yeah. they're actually, I think, proud um, to have a member of parliament who has kind of like, yeah. you know, said like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And, um, and so it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Of course, I've had people who, when I knock on doors would be like, well, where's your baby? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's not like I left him at home by himself. Where's your right? baby? Yeah, exactly. Like, where are your kids? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, a few people like that, but like 95% of people have been amazing and supportive. And I also think that in many ways, like the Canadian public is much further advanced yeah. than parliament, right? Mm-hmm. And the kind of chattering class um, in politics in Canada. And so, you know, most people would be like, oh, well, how, like, how long are you going to take for your maternity leave? And I'd be like, oh, I'm going to take eight weeks. And they were like, why aren't you taking a year? And I'm like, oh, we don't get, we don't get a year. Like we don't get any time. Um, and they would just be horrified, right? That mm-hmm. like, that was the case. Um, and actually one cool story mm-hmm. is that um, in June of 2019, uh, then government house leader, Bardish Chagger introduced a motion. It received unanimous consent. No one batted an eye. I stood up and applauded loudly because we passed um, parental leave for members of parliament uh, unanimously in the House of Commons. So that's, you know, something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, But then it was really, I was super self-conscious when I like rolled up to uh, parliament and pulled out a stroller and was walking around the hill um, with a stroller. But again, you know, it was, um, it was generally a positive experience. It was something that like I had to stand my ground in a lot of places because you know, we have um, boats that go for 24 hours sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I was breastfeeding a three month old. Yeah. And I had to say like, no, I'm like, I'm going home. Right. Yeah. Like, so. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of, I mean, that's the part of politics that can change. Like the only reason why politics can't change is because someone is saying, no, it has to be this way. Yeah. And the question then is, well, why does it have to be this way? And it's then the answer is generally, well, because this is the way it's always been done, yeah. or you got into it knowing that this is what it would be like. But according to whose like unwritten rule book, um, or if even if there is a written rule, yeah, like well, let's change it. But let's like so you know the most of the rules in Parliament were established in the nineteenth century. Yeah, exactly. Right? When it was all men. Yeah, mostly white. No, right? there were no washrooms for there, women. There were no washrooms yeah. for women. Um, when uh, they would get on a train, mm-hmm. go to Ottawa for months at a time, 
right? Leave their families behind. They go back for without a second thought, without a second thought. And no one's yeah. saying, where's your child? No, exactly. They were never asked that. And you know, we're, we're at a milestone. We now have over a hundred members of parliament that are female. Mm-hmm. Super exciting, yeah. right? That's great. Um, I think Marcy Ian was here. I think yeah. she was, I don't know if she was number 99 or number 100, but like, you know, really exciting, you know, mm-hmm. like we we're we're breaking down those barriers, but we also like, we can also change how parliament works because it's not just about getting more women into parliament. It's getting them to stay there. Mm -hmm. And I'll remember the first summer that I had Oliver and, um, I was, you know, it was, it was tough. Like I was, I was trying to figure out, okay, what's the balance here? Because as a parliamentarian, you feel like you need to do everything. Right. And, and I certainly did. Um, and I tried my best to, to be everywhere, but I was like, I have a, I have a four month old baby. Like, how do I, how do I manage this in a way that's healthy for me and for my child? Yeah. Right. And I'm still like, being a good MP. Yeah. Like, babies need yeah. like so yeah. many. <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. And like most of the time I just like put Oliver in the snuggly and like, yeah, yeah. until he was six months old, that was fine. Like yeah. he was super adaptable, like whatever he went everywhere, yeah. but at six months it got a, you know, he needed more engagement than mm-hmm. just being like strapped to me. Um, and he made himself no in mm-hmm. that case, like in meetings, he was like, no, 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 I don't want to be in these meetings anymore. Like pay attention to me. Um, but I called Sheila Copps oh. because, um, she was the first MP to give birth, um, as a member of parliament mm-hmm. back in 1988. And I called her and I just said, like, I need some guidance here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm kind of swimming blind. Like I need some guidance as to, as to what to do and how to manage this. And she gave me some good advice. And then she posed the question to me, like, what do you want to accomplish here? And I said to her, well, you know, I've got this legislation. I really want to get it passed. And she was like, no, <laughs> like, what do you want to be different mm. about your experience and impact in parliament? And I said, I want it to be easier for the next person mm-hmm. to do this because it's, it's really hard. Like this system is not built for us, mm-hmm. right? Like this institution is not built for women. Yeah. But it's definitely not built for mothers. Yeah. And, um, she said, okay, well then make a change. Right. And mm-hmm. so if I can think about those changes, you know, and it wasn't just me, but you know, the family room in parliament, which is one step, it's not quite enough. Right. Um, but parental leave mm-hmm. for members of parliament, like, you know, those things. And then, you know, this, um, like hybrid parliament, you know, if we can keep some of these aspects mm-hmm. so that if, you know, you, you yourself are ill, right? You don't have to be wheeled in on a stretcher to parliament to vote. Yeah. It's happened, yeah. right? Um, you know, you can vote maybe remotely. Um, if you have, you know, you're going through chemo treatments, you don't have to like risk your health um, for this. If you have a family member that's sick or ill or you give birth, like you don't have to rush back. Mm-hmm. Like you can, there's, you know, there's ways for us to actually modernize parliament that doesn't get rid of any of the necessary things that we have to do as MPs, but like makes it more human. Mm-hmm. And I think will actually lead to better members of parliament because you know the divorce rate for parliamentarians is like over 75%. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know it's huge. Yeah. Right. But I mean, not surprising. Not surprising. Yeah. Right. But like, why do we want that? Right. Yeah. You know, don't we want to have parliamentarians who can be well-rounded Yes. You know, and I have family lives. So. I say that and in my, the back of my mind last night on Netflix, I'm not sure if you've seen it yet, but I just finished watched, I'm watching Anatomy of a Scandal. Have you seen it? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Talking about parliament, parliamentarians and yeah. like intrigue. It's anyways, um, that's like not, not <laughs> in any way, that's yeah. not like what you want. That's um, at all. Um, that's like, so interesting and it's like it's so great to hear and I just want to add in on one extra layer from a former staffer yeah. with my former staffer hat on is that some of those policies need to also trickle down yeah right yeah because we also need more women working you know not only in the bureaucracy but it's political staff totally um so yeah yeah and and making it an environment where you know people and all their diversity can thrive. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I always think that like, you know, my job as a parliamentarian is, you know, I'm not going to necessarily win every battle, but I'm going to fight for them, but we need to have that diversity represented Mm -hmm. 
in the House of Commons because we need to have people with lived experience who can talk about the policies that we're thinking about and how it's going to impact them and their lives. And we need to have staff who have those experiences as well. And so like this institution was created in 1867, right? Hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. And there are changes that we can make to adapt to the 21st century that will reflect the 21st century. And it will still uphold all of those, you know, conventions and values and important roles that we have to play, but that also, you know, don't exclude half the population exactly. or don't make it so that you have, um, so that you have women who have to choose between a career in politics or having a family. Like yeah. that choice should not have to happen. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I completely or for men agree. too, right? Yeah, it's no, whoever yeah. wants that choice. Yeah. Um, whether, you know, you're a woman or, you know, you're gay or like, and you have a kid, you, yeah. you and your partner have a, a family, like we need everyone at the table. Yeah. 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 Um, and going back to what we started the conversation with, which was childcare, all of these things different, like there are just so many things that still need to be changed. Yeah. or tinkered with yeah. um, that will will create a, a, a more vibrant, a more um, equitable, a more diverse political system. Um, and like no one will, even if you don't think that you will benefit, you honestly will. Everyone will benefit from yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I mean, you hear it from CEOs of companies all the time that they say, okay, when I have more diverse voices around the table, like we we actually do better, mm. right? And yeah. that's the same in politics as mm. well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, well, I know your staff gave, uh, <laughs> I'm just waving, someone just like came in and I forgot to let her know uh, that this was going on. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have to unfortunately wrap things up. Yeah. I just want to thank you for like coming in today. And I'm so happy that you're like the first person I get to talk to like, like this like, <laughs> in person we're like in the same space um I think it definitely I mean I want to do this all the time now because I think it makes a better for a better experience um, yeah you were nervous about being in person I am. like a more it's kind of it's right? natural yeah. yeah like we're having coffee yeah well I also I like yeah, you just, it's, it's just a different dynamic. So thank you so yeah. much. Um, I know there's so many other things that we didn't even get a chance to talk to about. Um, but hopefully maybe we can do this again. Yeah. And sure. then um, it's on my like dream list to come to Ottawa and do like a pop-up shop. Cool. Um, so maybe we can do round two then. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'll look forward to seeing you in Ottawa. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. This is great. And like, keep it up. As oh. I said, like, I think for a lot of um, women involved in politics, like your, your store is, is, is like very special to us. Oh. It's very special. To us. I really appreciate that because like when I like make something or design something or create something, it's always like, A, would I, would, would I wear this myself? Yeah. Um, but also be like, do I think that other women in Canadian politics or just women in politics would, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just found out it's your birthday. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Well, thank you. That's why I was like, uh, this was, I mean, I, I like, there's two edges to it. It's like one I'm 39 today. So like getting very close to like 40. Yeah. So that's like a little bit of a mental thing. <laughs> um, so like one part of me loves birthdays yeah. and the other part of me doesn't really like birthdays, but today, like honestly, having you be here today was like my birthday present. <laughs> well, happy birthday. I'm so glad yeah. I could celebrate oh, with thanks. you. And like, I always feel we should be grateful for every year that we get to get older. Yeah. Right? Oh, getting older is definitely a, like, yeah. a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, even today when I was, like, putting on, like, my very minimal skincare routine, I was like, you know, 27-year-old me or 24-year-old me, like, never would have imagined, right? right? And maybe the same for you. Yeah. Um, like, you're, a, a, like, a, a federal cabinet minister, right? Like. Oh, no. I Yeah. When people, people ask cool. me that, yeah. Like, did you ever, like, how did you get to where you are? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. It just happened. But I mean, and not that it just happened. Obviously, it was a lot of hard work that went into yeah. it. But if you had asked, like, 17 year old, so I did, um, oh, you're open. This so is you, live. Yeah. So you someone's gotta, now, yeah. Yeah, you can answer. Okay. My son <laughs> <can> answer. <laughs> I guess this is the beauty of doing a live recording. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, if someone had asked me, like, I remember when I, I went to Parliament Hill with Forum for Canadians. Okay. And I was, 
15 Mm -hmm. and like was walking around there and being like, this is where I want to be. Right. But I never imagined myself as a member of parliament. I always thought of myself as a staffer. Mm -hmm. And if you had told me like, no, you are going to be not only a member of parliament, you're going to be a cabinet minister. I would have kind of laughed because I didn't, I didn't see myself because I didn't have points of reference. I know because there were so few women. Yeah. For women or young women. Yeah. Right. And I thought, oh, maybe one day I'll get elected, but it'll be when I'm in my fifties or sixties, after I've had my career, I never thought it would be when I was 28. Yeah. Yeah. I applied, fun fact, I applied for a forum for young Canadians and got denied. What? I know. Like, <laughs> anyways, so that's why I need to make Ottawa, obviously. Okay. You have to come to Ottawa. To, like, and you know year. what? I feel like women parliamentarians are going to welcome you with open arms. Oh. They're going to be really excited. To yeah. Have you there. I need to make it happen. As, to, as will staff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Uh, I really don't know if I should like look at the camera or look at you, but this was another episode of Elected. Um, thank you for joining us. And thanks so much for stopping by. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah.